did I miss? I wonder. But pastor, we're not going to have you come and share a lot, but come just real quick, just real quick. He told me he's going to, next week maybe, next Sunday, he would share a little bit. We got a little long today with the problems on the DVD there. But pastor, you, you told me in five words, I think it was, yeah. about your trip. So good to have pastor and Pat and the rest of you back too. Uh, glad you had a great time. Yeah. Yeah, we could sum it up in five words. We ran where Jesus walked. <laughs> we put on about 80 to 85 miles walking. Just wow. walking, so. But it, one thing that really impressed me a lot was at the Garden Tomb. And the British are in control of the Garden Tomb, but boy, did this guy, this tour guy who led the, uh, the, the talk at the Garden Tomb had a really good, clear presentation of the gospel, and they've led a lot of people to Christ uh, just through that presentation. So and there's lots more highlights, but I mean that just in a few words. Uh, the Garden Tomb was, in it, was great. The Sea of Galilee was great. We could have spent a lot of time out there. Uh, but there are tour guides. These guys, the first one we had, his name was Ramsey. He was a Christian. They were all Christians, but he had a seminary-level education on the Bible. I mean, he understood the Bible, and he just filled us up with it. So it was great. Amen. Okay, thank you. I want to take uh, this moment. To, it, it's it's uh, deer hunting season now, and, and some of our folks are out deer hunting and hope they get some uh, you know, venison meat. But I want to share with you just a couple stories. I, I, I went deer hunting once in my life, once in my life, although I was... When my dad and uh, uncle and uh, some of my older cousins would go deer hunting, I was out at the, out at the farm, uh, and uh, they'd bring the deer back in, all gutted out, cleaned out, and hang the deer out from the tree. So my cousin Jimmy and I, the same age, uh, we saw the, that deer hanging there. Dad and then went back out to the woods to try to get more deer, and uh, Jimmy and I got a great idea. We went, got a knife, and went and cut some of the meat right out of the deer. It was still warm. Then we went to the kitchen and got an old frying pan, put some butter in the pan, and put the deer meat in there and fried it up. And then we ate it. <laughs> it wasn't good. My dad said, you did what? I said, we cut some of the meat off the deer and ate it. He said, you, you don't do that. I didn't know. But then I went hunting one time. It happened to be uh, when we had to use shotguns and slugs. And so I was probably around 13 years old then, and so I was really excited to go hunting with my dad. He was an excellent shot, always got deer. And so we were out uh, in the North 40, I think it was called, and we were hunting. And I saw deer in the distance, and dad was getting out of the pickup, and, and I took my 20-gauge shotgun, I think it was, with a slug in it, and started running down the hill toward the deer. Now, these deer are like, you can hardly see them, but I was going to catch up to them, I think. But anyway, I... I Ran, I got as close as I thought I should, and I shot. You could see where that, because of snow, you could see where that slug hit about 30 yards from the deer. And I, and, and I, and I know I heard one or two of the deer snickering as they ran off. It was, I don't know, I guess that's buck fever or something. Well, we got to get to God's Word this morning. When Clero Wilson turned 16, he was ready to get out of foster homes and reform school, where he was living. He, so he lied about his age and joined the U.S. Air Force. Blessed with a nonstop personality, he entertained fellow airmen with so many funny stories that they claimed he was flipped out. The name, the name stuck. Leaving the Air Force, Flip Wilson found work at a, as a bellhop and started performing between paid acts at the hotel stage show where he was working. Before long, he was a successful comedian. One of Flip's most popular characters was Geraldine Jones. Somebody remember Geraldine? So you got to be pretty old like me, okay? <laughs> Geraldine was constantly misbehaving, crossing the line, and violating her conscience. But she had an excuse for doing wrong. Geraldine would always say, it wasn't me. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And boy, people laughed when they heard Geraldine say, the devil made me do it. Well, there are two mistakes we can make regarding the devil. First, we can exaggerate or overestimate his power. And second, we can underestimate his power. Sadly, it is not uncommon for people to make either too much or too little out of the devil. C.S. Lewis wrote this, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devil. 
One is to disbelieve in his existence, and there are many people that do disbelieve in his existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in him. The two extremes. It's true that we must not underestimate the devil. His very title, devil, comes from the Greek word diablos, which, from which we get our English word diabolical. The word literally means slanderer, slanderer, liar, accuser. He's also called Satan in the Bible, which means adversary. So the devil and Satan, I'll be using them interchangeably today, they're the same being. So one is our adversary, and the other, same one, the other is accuser. The names mean that. Seven books of the Old Testament speak of Satan, as does every single writer of the New Testament speaks of the devil. He is referred to as a real person, not just an impersonal force or influence. He is the thief that Jesus refers to in John chapter 10, verse 10, when he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He lays traps for us, attacks and accuses us, rejoices when we fall, and kicks us when we're down. Satan does. Satan is cunning, Cruel, deceptive, and dangerous. And the devil and his demons are on the hunt for you and me. The title of my message this morning, I announced it a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago maybe, is The Hunt, The Hunter, and The Hunted. My text is a very short one today. It's two verses or parts of two verses. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. You can turn there if you want. You probably know this one by heart. It says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, be self-controlled and alert. That's us that is being spoken to here. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion hunting for you, hunting for me. The first point I want to make this morning is to identify and then focus on this hunt that I've mentioned. The hunt. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, your eternal address changed from an awful place called hell to a beautiful place called heaven. On the day of your salvation, you passed from darkness into light, and Satan was not pleased. He lost a soul that day when you were born again. From the moment of your new birth, you have been engaged in an ongoing spiritual battle with the enemy who hates you and wants to destroy you. If not your life, then destroy your relationship with your Heavenly Father. That's what he wants to do. When I was in Campus Crusade for Christ in college, we would share the Four Spiritual Law booklet with students. And Law 1 of the Four Spiritual Laws stated that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. Well, it could also be said that Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. <laughs> he is your enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, hunting you down for the purpose of devouring you. Now, Satan's hunting season began in the Garden of Eden, and it continues to this day. Satan is relentless in his pursuit of the saints. When asked by God in Job chapter 1, verse 7, where have you come from? Satan actually could enter heaven at this point, and uh, the angels would come and stand before God, and there came Lucifer, Satan, the devil, same person. And Jesus asked, or God asked him, where have you come from? Satan replies, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. The earth is his domain. Like a skilled hunter, Satan patiently stalks his prey, waiting for that moment when he can gain and when he can attack and gain a trophy for his kingdom. This, this is why it is of utmost importance that we are self-controlled and alert and resist him by standing firm in the faith. If we face the wily old hunter in our own strength or in our spiritually weakened condition, then we are vulnerable to Satan's attacks, my friends. Listen. Satan loves to hunt among the hurting. He loves to hunt among the hurting. 
Now we see examples of Satan on the hunt throughout the scriptures. His first earthly hunt was the temptation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know the story. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Is where the devil appears to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent, a beautiful serpent. The tactic of his hunt here was to get Adam and Eve to doubt God's word. Does that sound familiar? Doubt God's word. So many today in our culture are doubting the word of God, ignoring the word of God, throwing out the word of God, and wishing that we would also throw out the word of God in our churches. Ain't going to happen here. Amen? Amen. So he wanted to get Adam and Eve to doubt God's word. Here's what it says, just uh, one of the verses, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, get this, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? How subtle. Did God really say? Is that what God said? That they shouldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden of Eden? No, that's not what he said. No, God told Adam and Eve that they could eat of any tree in the Garden of Eden except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. My friend, the devil knows the Word of God. But he also knows how to distort the Word of God. That's why we must be discerning when we listen to messages or listen to what's, you know, uh, taking in even preachers. Must be discerning. The devil planted a seed of doubt in Eve's mind, and then she, along with Adam, disobeyed God's word, and sin entered the world. This hunt goes to the devil. And I guess in one way, Adam and Eve could say, the devil did make me do it, but they still had a choice, and so do we. A second example of Satan's hunting expedition is found in the story of Job. In Job chapter 1, we discover how Satan came into the presence of God and requested permission to test this righteous man named Job. Satan says, you know, Job serves you. Job serves you because he's rich. You blessed him so much. You take away everything Job has and he'll curse you, God. God granted Satan permission to do whatever he wanted with Job short of killing him. You know the rest of the story, right? All who Job loves and all that he possesses were taken from him. But even in this, Job did not sin nor curse God. Job wins this hunt. The most familiar of the devil's hunts was, of course, the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 4 and also in Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1. Following his baptism, Jesus led into the desert to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. Think of that. No food, no water, 40 days. The devil comes to offer Jesus three specific temptations when his hunger was greatest and his resistance lowest. You know, the devil does the same thing to us. He comes to us at our most vulnerable times and tempts us to give in to sin. He knows that weak spot. He knows when we're down and out. And he attacks. He's on the hunt. The devil knew that if he could get Jesus to sin, that he would have his greatest trophy, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Of course, we know that Jesus defeated the devil with the Word of God. And I'm thinking that it was this event that Martin Luther was thinking of when he penned the third verse of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Listen to the third verse. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word can fell him. One little word shall fell him. Praise God, I believe that one little word Martin Luther had in mind was the name of Jesus. Amen? And so this hunt clearly goes to Jesus. Three hunts. There's more. Peter was hunted down by the devil to deny Jesus. There's many of them throughout Scripture. But we need to move on to the hunter. The hunter. The hunter, as stated previously, is Satan, also called the devil and Lucifer. The devil is a person just as real as God. He is not as powerful as God, but he is just as real. The Bible reveals that Satan was one of the most magnificent creatures ever created. He was the climax of God's creative wisdom. 
He was not always the evil character we know him to be today. Satan or Lucifer was once a beautiful angel of light. While in heaven, Satan, along with one-third of the angels, rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven and down to earth. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and referring to Satan's fall from heaven, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Satan is certainly determined and powerful foe. But it is important to remember that Satan's power is limited, while God's power is unlimited. Unlike our God, Satan is not omnipotent, all-powerful. He's not. Satan is not omniscient, all-knowing. He's not. And Satan is not omnipresent everywhere at one time. Here is what Pastor Greg Laurie writes about Satan. Satan does not possess these divine attributes that I just mentioned. Satan is very powerful, more powerful than any man, and more powerful than most angels. But he is not anywhere near to being equal, to being the equal of God. His knowledge is limited, and he can't know all our thoughts. Satan can be in only one place at a time. And here's an important thing to remember. Satan can do nothing in the life of the Christian without God's permission and our acquiescence. The most important fact to remember about Satan is that he is a defeated foe. By, by his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ conquered death and hell and Satan. He's a defeated foe. Satan's greatest power is deception. He wants to deceive us, cause us to doubt the word of God. He's tricky, but he's not all-powerful, not all-knowing. He's not everywhere. And Christ conquered sin, death, and Satan at the cross. Moving on to the final point is the hunted. The hunted. It is that we are the hunted. That's right. John 10.10 makes it clear that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And my text this morning from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 provides insight into Satan's hunt for you. Where it says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Today there are men and women in the woods stalking their prey. Some sitting in a tree stand. Others trying to maybe drive the deer out of a bushes or slough. They're sneaking around. <laughs> they want to bag their, their deer, that big buck. Well, that's like Satan. He prowls around like a roaring lion, hunting, looking for someone to devour. And the one he's looking for is you and me. Each of us is confronted daily with the snares, the tactics, the tricks, and the devices of the devil and his demons. He is the God of this age, walking to and fro on this earth, seeking to drag people away from Christ. It seems that the devil is working overtime these days because he knows his time is limited and his time is limited. He is well aware that his end is the lake of fire where he will be forever along with his demons and those who never put their trust in Jesus. That should shake us, folks. That should shake us. Not that Satan and his demons are going to be in hell, but people that we know and people we love may also be there if they don't well, they will be there if they don't put their trust in Jesus. That should shake us. Yes, Satan the devil is a crafty, relentless hunter. But let's not give him too much credit for his successes. You see, Satan can tempt, but he can't force us to sin. None of us can claim that the devil made me do it. When you give in to sin or surrender to the devil's schemes, it's because you chose to yield to that temptation. Certainly Satan can put pressure on us to sin, but he cannot violate our free will. Don't blame your sin on Satan. He didn't make you do it. Listen, instead of blaming Satan, defeat him. Say no to sin. Flee from sin. Well, need to bring this to a conclusion. I don't know, I mentioned Sunday school. I'm, I'm on a muscle relaxer for my bad shoulder, which has been excruciating pain the last few days, so it drives me out, so I'll just take a glass of water here. You need to draw this to a conclusion this morning. 
In conclusion, let me share with you three powerful principles for overcoming Satan's attacks. They're very simple, but very important. First, submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves into God. Resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. Isn't that remarkable? He will flee from you because you are a child of God and you have the Holy Spirit living within you. That's power. That's power to make Satan flee from you. When you we cannot resist the devil in our own human power, though. We must be spirit-filled followers of Christ to overcome the hunter. We just sang this song of this verse in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. My friend, the one that dwells within you, the Holy Spirit of living God is in you if you're a believer. And greater is he who is in you than he, is in, he who is in the world. No demon, no devil is more powerful than you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. Satan is no match for our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so be sure to submit to God daily. Do it. Second, for overcoming Satan's attacks, resist the devil. I already mentioned that verse. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The most effective way to resist the devil is the same method used by Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. Stand on the word of God. Jesus resisted the devil by appealing to the scriptures. He used the same weapon that is available to, to every born-again believer, the word of God. It says in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You find that you're stumbling into sin, that you're practicing sin. My friends, get into the word of God because with the word of God dwells within, within you. That's the way to say no to sin. You need the word of God. Part of our armor is the sword of the Spirit. And, the, and it says the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. That's our offensive weapon. The word of God. Use it. Third, final powerful principle for overcoming Satan's attacks. Put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. I don't have time this morning, but you can find that armor listed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. All who want to live in obedience to Jesus and his word will face battles, spiritual battles. Brother and sisters, we are at war. Did you hear that? We are at war. Not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not people. We are to love our enemies. We are to do good to our enemies. No, we're at war not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Think of that. All those entities we are in war against. Isn't it any wonder that we need Jesus? That we need to be led and filled by his Holy Spirit? God has provided this spiritual armor to protect us and help us to conquer the enemy and overcome evil. To defeat the schemes of the devil, followers of Christ must be clothed in the armor of God. Wear it. Finally, I'm going to quote from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, verse 13. It kind of wraps up the armor of God verses. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We need to know about his schemes, but we are not to be overwhelmed by Satan. We are not to fear him, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. It goes on to say, therefore put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be, may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. I like that. Not run away. Not cower in a corner. <gasps> the devil's going to get me. The devil's going to get me. But to stand on the word of God and stand with God and he will stand with you. Yes, the devil was soundly and forever defeated at the cross of Calvary. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 speaks of Jesus' victory over Satan at the cross. It says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, o triumphing over them by the cross. The cross. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my soul, I can't remember the words, rolled away, rolled away. We have victory through Jesus, do we not? 
through the blood of Christ, through the word of God, we have victory over the devil and his forces. Praise the Lord. There indeed is victory in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, there's our hunting stories for today. The hunt, Satan's out to get you. He's scheming. The hunter, the devil. And the hunted, you and me. But we are victorious through Jesus Christ. So let's go forth. In the name of Jesus, push back the powers of darkness and share his gospel with everyone that we come, that we know. Because there is one day in eternal hell, Satan will be there. His demons will be there. But oh, I pray that the people I know and the people I love will not be there. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word this morning. I, I certainly do not want this message to be a downer. Lord, because we want to glorify you. And God, but we must be aware of, of Satan's tactics, of his schemes. We must be aware that he's a powerful foe. But Lord, we are so grateful that one little word shall fell him, and that is the name of your son, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There really is something about that name. So we thank you, we praise you for your goodness to us, for the victory you have through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, let's all stand and we're...